Welcome to the Road to Dracula Visions Artist Spotlight. Soon! <laughs> for See, more less, information, less than two, two weeks. Less than two weeks, guys. So uh, for more information, check out the Slam Pressed Homes Facebook page. Click the little button at the top. Put in your email. You get some behind-the-scenes information with our newsletter. In addition, we have our pre-launch page up for the Kickstarter. So sign up for that. You can find that on the same page. Um, and you'll be notified at launch. And I will tell you, if you are interested at all uh, in this project, uh, you'll probably want to be one of the earlier folks to uh, um, at least at least within the first 50 folks uh, to pledge on uh, Dracula Visions. I'm once again uh, joined by Mr. Sam Moore. How are you, sir? Excellent, excellent. Really excited. We are Busy, busy, busy uh, getting the campaign ready. And yeah, there are some amazing surprises. So you sign up for the newsletter and sign up for the uh, pre-launch page to get notified because the early bird, uh, early bat in this case, the is early be bat. pretty uh, exciting. <laughs> and our guest tonight is an Eisner Award winner, a Harvey Award winner, a Joe Schuster Award winner. He's also uh, this past year nominated for an Eisner as a cover artist for Stillwater. Uh, Martin, how did you coerce him into doing the hardcover <laughs> for Dracula Visions? Uh, very gently. <laughs> very gently. He's a busy man. He, he so held me, very he held in me, demand. Held me by knife point, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have the one and only cartoonist illustrator, uh, multi-award winner, also a uh, star of the popular TV series, when everything is coming your way, you're in the wrong lane, <laughs> Mr. Ramon Perez. Thanks for joining of, us tonight. I'm a pleasure. I, I didn't know I was part of a TV series. Though. This is amazing. Star, <laughs> should writer. There some, should there be some residuals coming my way? Like, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? Good, 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 good. So as per usual, we'll put up uh, just a few pieces of art. Um, maybe some folks uh, that maybe not too be may not be too familiar uh, with mm -hmm. some of the things that you've done. You've, you've done a lot of things uh, across the gambit. Um, and as you go through, uh, Sam will be asking you a few questions. Sure, um, sure. And then I will, will get into the process a little later. Sounds good to me. <laughs> For the folks out there that aren't aware, uh, your Eisner win was for uh, a project associated with Jim Henson. Do you want to tell us a little bit about A Tale of Sand? 
For sure, yeah. Uh, I was uh, flattered when I we were nominated for five Eisners and we ended up winning three, which was, you know, as an individual who had been in the industry for quite a while, it just blew my mind uh, when it happened. But it was an amazing project uh, to be part of. Um, I basically... What uh, uh, what had developed was I was adapting uh, a lost uh, screenplay that Jim had written back in the late '60s, um, maybe early '70s. I can't remember the original date offhand. And it was a, a movie very much in the vein. If you ever seen like Yellow Submarine, uh, Head, mm. um, uh, The Wall, like those kind of that era of mm -hmm. uh, rockumentaries, films, uh, that sort of thing, and. And uh, it, uh, it very was very much in that vein, and he couldn't get anybody to produce it. Uh, you know, they were citing costs, um, market, you know, everything. So it just got shelved, basically. It was very similar to his, um, I don't know if you're, people have seen his short called Time Piece, which I believe he was nominated or won an Oscar for, uh, if I recall. But uh, anyways, it was a, a, a wonderful script. Um, very much before his time in the Muppets, and he really uh, was exploring the idea of self, uh, his own particular journey. I mean, this is me extrapolating a bit, but this is the sense I got mm -hmm. from it after seeing a lot of his work from the time. Um, just really kind of finding his way as an artist, finding his voice, and finding his place in the world, and how we all do that, like in our own different way, make it make it something of our own personal journey and how we succeed and, and you know, what our, our biggest hurdles are in life and, and that sort of thing. So it was a joy to, uh, a joy to, to work on. I was given free reign by Archaea Publishing at the time and it allowed me to kind of just stretch my, my wings and, and create something that I never really have had had to that point in the comics or even just illustration career i had developed to that point but uh, it was it was truly a freeing and uh, i guess it shows in the work and the passion came through and we got the nominations which uh, was like i said truly flattering mm -hmm. and uh jim henson of course casts a long shadow here across all our childhoods uh, in terms of his uh, creativity and his vision uh you you mentioned having to i guess sort of extrapolate uh from the uh, screenplay how mm -hmm. was was that uh, a daunting process for you or no to, I mean to be honest it came quite naturally like uh, it was a, it's a weird screenplay but I dove right in and my editor was there Stephen Crispy uh, by my side late night phone calls as we discussed the script it uh, the character's journey throughout it and stuff so it was actually quite a, a natural process and uh, trying to figure out the pacing from, you know, because you're, you're, you're taking something that was meant for it to be moving pictures uh, with uh, a very, very particular uh, audio score to the film, because he was, he, there was lots of notes in the, in the script about what kind of music would be playing or sounds that the character would hear. And uh, so that was probably the hardest part was how do I translate all these audio and uh, like an animated or you know movement like film cues into uh, you know sequential stills and so it was a uh, but it, like to be honest it actually it came about about quite naturally it, uh, there were very few times where it was you know I think the hardest part was going through the whole book and then having to truncate parts uh, due to space and then I think kind of nail down the opening because that was a I did the opening first as I worked through the, the script um, uh, in order, uh, but then the, the opening never quite sat right to me. So I kind of worked my way back to the once you kind of immerse yourself in the world and you get a better vibe for it. And it allowed me to go back full circle and kind of reestablish what I wanted the opening to feel like. And then I also worked closely with the designer of the book to make sure uh, we had the design and the way you read the book flow naturally. Uh, from credits to uh, design into the panel by panel sequence too as well. So it was a very kind of a truly collaborative process uh, um, that I've ever experienced on any project in my, my time in comics so far. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, book design. That's a thread we'll kind of uh, pick up a little later when we start talking about Raid Press specifically. Oh, for sure. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, uh, your next 
major project that that you're often associated with is uh, Jane, a contemporary, I guess, uh, version of the classic novel Jane Eyre. How did you get involved with that? That was uh, one of those uh, scenarios that, uh, you know, it's funny because uh, it came about through Kismet or whatever you might want to call it. Uh, so the writer, Aline Brosh McKenna, who is uh, a screenwriter who had worked on her probably biggest, uh, but at that point was um, The Devil Wears Prada. And since then, she's been the showrunner on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and a few other projects. <laughs> but uh, uh, she was actually, uh, her office was on the Henson lot. <clears throat> And uh, so my editor, uh, Stephen Christie, had befriended her uh, uh, while working because he was like, uh, he was the editor for the for Tale of Sand, but he was also the liaison with um, the Henson Company. So he'd be visiting the lot quite often um, in LA and uh, eventually ended up meeting Aline and chatting with her about, you know, the film industry, comics, and stuff like that. And it kind of came about that she wanted to do a graphic novel. She had fallen in love with uh, the medium after a, a friend or a colleague had given her a few books to read. And her, her you know, her one of her long-standing favorite uh, books was uh, uh, Jane Eyre. And she wanted to take that and adapt it into um a graphic novel and so th her search uh, through with Stephen Christie began looking for an artist and they actually met with many artists prior uh, to meeting with me and uh, it's funny because I think it, they'd been this has been kind of happening coincidentally with Tale of Sand and she then uh, or he then suggested me and asked if I'd be interested in meeting with her so on one of my next visits uh, to LA, I think I was there for a press junket or something or during Tale of Sand. Uh, I went out over to uh, Aline's office and we met and just chatted and we kind of found we had a lot of touchstones artistically, things we liked, uh, the story, our personalities meshed. And so she was like, yeah, this guy, this is, this is the guy basically. Um, and that pro project was in development probably for about almost from the immediate point of Tale of Sand ending. Maybe like I think I signed on within a year of Tale of Sand ending, but that, you know, I didn't that didn't come out till 2017. So there was a lot of development, about five years of. Oh wow! Yeah, script writing. <laughs> uh, the script went through a lot of changes. It, it 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 even morphed into, like if you were to compare some of the scripts to the story that you actually would hold in your hands years later, vastly different. Um, so there was a lot of back and forth and. And chatting, and uh, she basically wrote a screenplay uh, that I then adapted because she was like, "I don't know how to write for comics," and I was like, "That's cool. Just do what you do best, and then I'll do what I do best, which is take your script and then adapt it to the the medium." Which uh, was she was quite all right to do because that you know meant she could flex her muscles the way she was familiar with, and then I would just take it and adjust it to the uh, the written page basically. And it was a uh, interesting just working with such a great writer and seeing the evolution of how a script occurs even was a fascinating experience uh, uh, chatting with her and, and then adapting this you know very classic tale to a very modern setting so it was a, a very different kind of story to, than a tale of sand but uh, just as exhilarating and just as exciting to work on that's really interesting given the fact that uh, essentially you were adapting uh, two screenplays back to back and uh, was Jane developed uh, with the intention that it could be pitched as a as a TV or a, a movie project as well? I don't I, when she was writing the script or the screenplay she I don't think she intentionally uh, was writing it to pitch as a film. Uh, whether Arkea or uh, herself has shopped it around since, I, I'm unaware. I know that there was some discussion early on about a, a, a film adaptation, but uh, I think for, it was more so just having her write in the way she was familiar with and not having to worry about panel to panel or page to page breakdowns. I was just like, you don't mm -hmm. worry about that. You you know, write in the language you know, and then I'll translate it into the language I know, basically. Uh, which I think was uh, that way she she wouldn't have the stress of like what's you know how do a how's a page turn how's a panel breakdown work like um, so let me take care of that and uh, you know kind of like each of us does what we do best basically and I think for sure out, I think it, I think it resulted in a better pro a project basically at the end of the day a better book. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, let's uh, transition over to your position as, uh, as you like to put it, uh, head cat herder yeah. here at Raid <laughs> Studios. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. What does that entail, especially with uh, this new initiative of Raid Press that's been uh, going on the past couple of years and has been ramping up the past uh, year and into 2022? It really means I get no sleep is what it really means. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, to be honest, I mean, it's like it's, I joined Raid back in 2006, so it's been quite a, a long haul for me with the studio. And I came in as a member, you know, uh, Chip Sadarsky, Kagan McLeod, uh, were the founders along with Cameron Stewart and um, Ben Shannon and Ben Shannon. And then I replaced Kagan and was just, you know, the new guy on the block where eventually I became the oldest member on the block once all the original <laughs> members over the years left and the studio just kind of inadvertently grew over the years as uh as you know a new artist came in uh you know uh we moved to a, a larger space at one point so we could need to populate it with more people so that grew and students would join and then become full-time artists and so it became a very organic uh you know i, I said i always said that it has a life of its own it's its, its own beast basically um, I just try to make sure it's well fed and in a happy state. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so then, uh, in, in, in recent years, um, we moved to a larger space, uh, much like quadruple the size of our, our previous. And we, um, we, we opened up a front facing gallery cause we're on street level now, something that was very new to us with a cafe, our own mini store. And we, what I what really happened with this new space is I tried to create something that uh, would be inviting to, to not only artists, but writers, creative people in general, a place where they could come and collaborate, meet like minded individuals, uh, open up new doorways for themselves. If they're, you know, established people, they get uh, kind of like a, a sense of um, a new vibe in their life or whatever. It's like a new energy by coming into a, a space populated with multiple creators. Or if you're, um, or if you're um, a young artist, you have a, a somewhere to come and actually I mean, ex explore crazy. explore options and basically, um, sorry, explore options and uh, um, uh, maybe get work and and grow and you know be amongst your peers basically. So I, it's it's something uh, you know I was uh, excited to be a part of and I truly love the space. I mean I've been here 16 years practically. Wow. Um, and I see the like I, I I constantly see the value of a space like this, uh, even beyond myself. Some a place for mm -hmm. artists to gather and, and create together. Um, and then around 2017, prior to moving into our current space, we kind of embarked on uh, publishing some of our own uh, project or material. Because you know one of the things we do in our industry, we're always working for other people. And uh, we really want to kind of take the, the reins and put our own work out there. So we started the Raid Anthology to kind of be like uh, a, a hallmark uh, of the talent within Raid and also the, the people within our network outside of the studio as well. A place where we could like create these books, people could tell the stories they wanted to, to tell and without having to worry about uh, what, what market does this fit into, what's the, you mm. know, what... Uh, what will the editors say or whatever? I mean, we, we do work with them to try to get them, you know, make sure that the story is the best it can be. But at the end of the day, we also try to make sure everybody has as much free reign as possible. And uh, and that kind of has kind of spiraled into, in a positive way, a manner spiraled into Raid Press where uh, there's so many things that I know myself and other creators in Raid want to do and have talked about doing. And now the, the time is rife with things like Kickstarter with, this like or barely existed 10 years ago are now you know all blank oh no yeah you're there okay just want to make sure oh. that i didn't get there. <laughs> okay um, pause there for a second oh did i yeah. yeah so uh so basically it's a way to just uh, like it's a place uh, for creators by creators to to get our stuff out there and hopefully you know you use that as a springboard to larger avenues or just get your stuff out there and see what happens. Get Let people know uh, what you want to create. And, and I think while there's multiple avenues such as, you know, Webtoons or Tumblr, or Facebook, anywhere you want to put your work, you can. But there's still nothing as amazing as holding your own book in your hands. Sure. A tactile thing that you can share with not only friends, family, fans, 
but other uh, people in the publishing industry as well. So I think it's just a way for us to get our ideas out there without having, you know, having worked in publishing a long time, not just comics. I know there's a lot of hurdles, a lot of things, a lot of check marks you have to check when talking to a publisher to make sure they're like, where can we sell you? Where, can, where do you fit in the market? Uh, that, and that's one of the main reasons, like early on, uh, I went to web comics because you know, they, I try to pitch these things to, to publishers. And they were like, this is great, but can we change A, B, and C? And I was like, not <laughs> really. I don't want to change it. I just want to do the story I want to do. I don't want to worry if it's going to be for kids. Is it going to be for adults? I just want to do it and, you know, put something out of quality and let the audience find it and, and grow with it and get excited by it. So I think that's the main kind of the impetus for what raid raid press has become basically well it's very cool the way you talk about uh, holding a book in your hands because uh, i know just from uh observation over the past year <laughs> and uh you are most people don't realize this you are an incredible uh, incredibly uh a gifted and and skilled designer uh, not oh, just a you. comics creator, <laughs> and it's been an absolute pleasure actually to see you at work uh, behind the scenes, just doing the the book designs here at exactly. here at Raid Press. In terms of you're always very focused on the quality, the little things that maybe not pe people wouldn't even notice at first glance, mm -hmm. subtleties of the spot gloss, or mm -hmm. you know, uh, adding in. Uh, French flaps, for example. Uh, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the holistic process you you take to not only the the you know design on the page, but the physical tactile experience oh, yeah. of the end reader, especially as a as a, a publisher now? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I mean, design. I mean, I think good design. Uh, I mean, when when good design is there, it goes unnoticed. When it's bad design, you notice it. You know, what right. I mean? and <laughs> I always want to make sure. And I mean, this is what I actually went to school for. I did not go to school to learn how to draw comic books. That's something that's self-taught. I went to school for publishing and book design, uh, graphic design, and illustration. Like, Because all that stuff goes hand in hand. It, it complements each skill set complements the other. So um, when I do get my a chance to stretch my legs doing things like book design, I yeah, I'll, I'll definitely sit there and, 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 and hem and haw and, and work over the details till they're perfect and, you know, as with anything, they're never perfect, but you know, you you live and learn with each project, and and you try to make each one better. But I really try to, um, when creating a book, uh, create like an experience that like every, every whether it's like the opening the French flap and seeing something in behind that might be, happening, <laughs> or um, you know, just the quality of the paper, the yeah, like the, you were saying, uh, Sam, the the small touches like spot gloss or foil stamping. And how to use it in an elegant way rather than uh, a garish or garish way exactly. Mm. So, um, and I think uh, unfortunately the comic industry is, is is rife with a lot of tacky garish things. So <laughs> mm -hmm. anything we can do to elevate the medium, and there's a lot of great publishers who do it, uh, which I'm constantly <clears throat> inspired by. Um, so I I just take inspiration from them and just uh, you know in my own uh, history. And knowledge base and just try to make these amazing products and, and try to make them something beautiful that people want to hold and leave out to you know experience by you know their guests or share with a friend or whatever it might be i know uh, as the books arrive in house it's always quite exciting that uh, mm -hmm. that tactile experience you're, oh, you're yeah. talking from uh, within the past couple of weeks mr monster came in yeah. uh which you designed uh, quite a striking cover design as well Thank and you. uh forest folk as well Yep. by Dax Gordine and now yeah. Raid uh, Raid 4 the, yeah. the Raid 4 yeah the Raid 4 yeah. anthology uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your contribution to Raid 4 and the new revelation that it is going flip book format yeah for sure I mean oh, cool. uh, so <laughs> with uh, with Raid 4 I mean like I said earlier in the conversation uh, it is a, a book we try to do every year uh, the pandemic obviously put a bit of a monkey wrench into last year and most of this year so it's a bit late on the uh, on the arrival but basically it's a way for you know all the creators to get out there and do their own thing and with volumes one through three which uh, uh, I could I, I consider the first trilogy of books we we played with certain aspects design we've, we kept a very classic very Chicago style uh, classic book design and so with um, 
uh, volumes uh, 4, uh, 5, and 6, uh, starting off with the one we're about to uh, kickstart in a few months or a couple months now. Um, it will be, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're playing with something different. We're, uh, I'll be adding different design elements uh, uh, on the covers. I'll be treating them very <coughs> differently than the first three uh, volumes. and But also playing with like the idea of a flip book, kind of creating an avenue where we can create a different unique experience where uh, we'll have two covers, we'll have uh, the story sectioned off more maybe by theme a little bit, by, by, by feeling, um, allowing uh, creators a more diverse array of stories that can tell because, you know, sometimes when you have a book, you know, that reads front to back, you kind of want to have a, a particular theme or a particular vibe throughout of it. And this way, by doing a flip, you can almost be treating it like it is essentially a, a, its own book on the other side. So we will gather the tales in, in one regard on one side and then on the other side. But it's actually been a lot of fun. And the way we're doing it now, we're actually, because of the format change, uh, we'll actually be getting a lot more pages of art despite not changing the page count from uh, the first three books, keeping it at 128 pages. Um, well, the way we put, I push the, the design of the book to the edges um, in, a, in a fun and interesting way uh, allows us to give more body uh, to the book itself and, and actually have more stories and more art, which is actually a, a great way uh, to, to change it up really for the, for the books. Yeah, and it's, it is notable that uh, Brain Anthology are slightly larger than uh, regular comic format to yeah. accommodate uh, uh, showcasing the art better. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, do, we do the magazine size, so basically... You know, we got the first three here, which you can see, and uh, they have their own theme with the the robot on the cover, and uh, and different things like this. And you know, we, you can see the spot gloss there on Mr. Robot there, <laughs> and stuff like that. Things we've played with on every cover. You know how we tackle it, the design, the bold colors, and um, so yeah, we, they're they're fat books, and uh, definitely looking forward to uh, to getting the next batch out. And then basically introducing people, introducing people to a variety of new creators as well. Like that's the other great thing. People have been buying all these books. They get standalone stories, but they also get um, uh, every every volume has a. Uh, we make sure to have a set of new creators in it to introduce people um, to artists and writers that maybe they're unaware of, unheard of, um, and just kind of let those creators create something they want the public to to know them for, basically. And do you want to give a little hint about your contribution to uh, the latest anthology? I know there's a, been a striking astronaut and skeleton <laughs> image uh, that's been teased out onto the interwebs. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, not the cover of the book. It's just a, an image I created for my story, but ended up using, because uh, it was the quickest thing on hand at the time, <laughs> uh, for uh, teasing Raid for itself. And uh, my, my story, I guess, is uh, basically... Uh, one that's kind of actually stemmed from the pandemic itself. It's about uh, I, a bit of a, a bit of a um, the comfort, the, the sense of identity, and but also the fears of what we dealt with in the, in the pandemic, which is like who to listen to, what's what's news, what's not news, what's what's reality, uh, what are the chances you take um, to move forward and who do you trust basically. And it's kind of like, I distilled it into kind of a bit of a, uh, a space kind of sci-fi adventure, if you will, which, you know, sci-fi is a great, um, avenue to doing, I mean, it's, you know, that's what Star Trek did in the beginning is distilling, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the political <clears throat> and personal landscapes of reality into the sci-fi genre to kind of make it more digestible, but, you know, also provoke thought. So it's kind of a, uh, a short story, it's like 10 pages or 12 pages um, to kind of just get get people thinking a little bit about their position in life and also the the moves they make when and if they choose to make them, basically. All right. And then finally, before we head into uh, Martin's section of the interview, <laughs> uh, let's let's just uh, talk <laughs> quickly about uh, your 2022 Raid Press <laughs> release, Kookaberry, which is actually a revival yep. of your old uh, web series, uh, webcom, yeah. Kookaberry. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So Kookaberry, I started with uh, back in 2007, we had a web comics movement called uh, Transmission X Comics, which... We actually got a lot of uh, notoriety for back when uh, we were, because we were the first kind of professional 
comics creators to move into the web genre. Now it's like commonplace, but back then it was actually noteworthy. Um, and this is where things like Charles Christopher, uh, Carl Kirschel's latest, uh, you know, books came from. And uh, so, yeah, Kookaburi was my story that uh, I put forward. There was kind of an Alice in Wonderland, a voyage of uh, self-discovery, um, you know, a lighthearted tale with, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an individual finding their way um, and kind of accepting the responsibility for, for their actions, if you want to distill it down to a, a simple way. Um, but uh, yeah, I kind of put that on hiatus uh, back in early 2011 or no, 2012 was the last time I updated regularly. And because uh, my career just went off in a, in a very crazy tangent with, you know, Tale of Sand, with uh, Jane Eyre, uh, lots of Marvel work I'd done, uh, various cover work for other companies. So it was really, it kind of unfortunately got ushered to the back burner. And it's, and it's this thing I've always regretted because I loved working on it. I loved building that story and building that world. And, you know, we come back to the things we love, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's something I've felt is unfinished. I relaunched it early pandemic uh, for uh, a, a, a few months and then that kind of fell by the wayside because the pandemic hit and the headspace wasn't just quite right for creating at that time. Mm. Um, so the idea is to actually collect the edition, the book into uh, several editions because in one book it'd be a bit too, uh, too hefty. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is to actually finish the story, but what started on the web will be finished in print. Uh, eventually, I probably will release uh, uh, portions of it in, in, on the web again. It is available <clears throat> at kookaburi.com for everybody to read if they're so inclined. And also on Instagram at, in, at kookaburi. Um, but yeah, my, I've, I always envisioned it as a book. And now I'm just kind of making the moves to make that happen, basically. Well, that's really interesting yeah. just to pick up on what you had said earlier in terms mm -hmm. of uh, comparing Ray Press, the liberation mm -hmm. of uh, creativity with Ray mm -hmm. Press to the liberation of uh, exploring in the webcomic medium. Mm -hmm. What are the challenges of uh, taking what was meant for uh, web consumption into, into print now? Well, I mean, to be honest, it always was, in, even back then, I always meant it for print. So all the work mm -hmm. was done with print in mind. The pacing was a little bit more, uh, because of the way I updated the comic, the, the pacing was a bit rapid fire to keep the, the audience interested. So there is, I, I've always called it my, my um, first draft online with the, the final draft meant to be print. So when I go to print, I'll be adding in pages between pages to kind of smooth out the pacing so it's not so rapid fire that it has more of a, a nice, um, I don't know what you want to call it, iambic pentameter. I don't know, like the, what, <laughs> more musical in its way, instead of like a staccato. And, you know, uh, so uh, the, I will be finessing it into its new form uh, where it's meant to live uh, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, basically. Are you talking like sort of cliffhangers to bring people back week after week? Yeah, which work on a, on a web comic. But if you if you do that, every page turns a bit of a cliffhanger. You're like, <laughs> it's, it's a bit much, right? So yeah. Um, uh, it's basically just adding a few pages in here and there. Because I think early on, I leaned into that. Uh, later on in the story, as I was developing it, I tried to think a bigger picture. So it kind of smooths out a little bit later on in the, in the story. Um, but the probably the first you know 30 to 50 pages uh, of the stuff that is online uh, are a little bit rapid fire. So I just want to kind of just want to tone it down, give it a better beat, basically. And, and a beaten rhythm and to make it work better for print. And that means people are getting something who, who do uh, pick up the, the book and, or back the campaign will be getting something unique to the printed form that does not exist online, oh. basically. So that's the other positive there. All right, over to you, Martin. Oh boy. Uh, oh, here we scary. go. All here right. Here we go. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Thanks, Ramon. All right. <laughs> My pleasure. Is, is that, was that just water or? That's just water. Maybe, she, maybe, maybe it should be straight vodka. I don't know. Was that Ten. last night? <laughs> yeah, that was last night. Yeah. <laughs> Ten handpicked questions to determine your psychological profile, okay. aka the process. Okay, so these are all would you rather's. Okay. Uh, we're going to ease you into it, um, but then we're going to wrap it up pretty fast. <laughs> all right. Uh, would you rather's. I'm quite familiar with this game, thanks to my girlfriend. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. 
All right. Yeah. All right. So let's ease into this. Would you rather always say everything on your mind or never speak again? Oh, I would rather say everything on my mind. <laughs> I, I already kind of do, so <laughs> Perfect. I just try to be polite about it. <laughs> uh, would you rather have bad breath or smelly feet? I'd rather have smelly feet. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You, can All always, right. you can always tuck them into socks and in shoes. <laughs> No, no, no one's. You can going, blame the other guy too. No one's going out on all fours <laughs> sniffing your feet half the time, you know. But bad breath, ah, uh, you know. All right. Would you rather be abducted by aliens or kidnapped by terrorists? Oh, abducted by aliens, way more fun. <laughs> way more fun. Hi, uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. You get you get to see the stars. You you get new species. You get a little bit of probing. You know, it's, okay, okay. It's all good. It's okay. all good. It's all good. All, right. all right. Some people pay for that. Yeah. The Mons a sci-fi uh, guy. guy. <laughs> He's a sci-fi guy. <laughs> There's a story in there. Yeah. All right. This is where it ramps up. All okay. right. So, <laughs> would you rather have sex in your parents' bed? Or at a mattress store. Oh, interesting. Well, it probably depends how much I've drank that day, but I've probably, <laughs> done, I've probably done uh, one of them. I can tell you that for sure. So, uh, but I won't tell you which one. But these days, not wanting to be arrested, I would probably just have sex in my parents' bed. But, you know, it's, okay. a, little, it's a little bit uncomfortable. But you That's know. going on the cover of the Dracula, by the way. <laughs> We have our pull quote. I'm all, all, I'm right. all, for, I'm all for PDA, but you know, <laughs> sometimes, you know. Uh, would you rather be completely hairless or completely covered in hair? Hmm, interesting. <laughs> I don't know if I would look good either way. <laughs> but I think for the sake of, you know, human interaction, probably hairless. It might be creepier, but... Uh, <laughs> I can't imagine Summers as a werewolf. Basically, I just be. <laughs> I mean, unless I'm like uh, like uh, Chewbacca, and I got a good tuft of hair down the bottom part. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. Well, you can still wear clothes. You don't. Know, you don't have to go me. like all Bigfoot. Yeah, why can, not like... though? If you, got, if, you got a, if you got a hair suit on, why are you gonna put on pants? That's true. Oh, so just hard. wear a bandolier strap. Are, are yeah. you reconsidering your answer? No. <laughs> Actually, maybe. Could be interesting. <laughs> Could be interesting, actually. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll stick with the one I put in, though. Just just for the just for the sake of my girlfriend. I don't know if she'd want to be dating a. a, 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 a That's fair. Song. Yeah. That's yeah. fair, especially if you shed. Exactly. Um, oh. Would you rather French kiss Betty White or Miley Cyrus? Is this at the current ages they're at? Betty White was a very yeah. handsome woman. Oh, I know. I, I've seen a lot of her classic films. Well, it would be uh, like tomorrow. Uh, to be honest, <laughs> tomorrow. You know what? Sure. I bet. I bet you. I bet you. Betty White's probably got some moves. I would go with Betty White. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well yeah. done. Well yeah. done. Rather than risk having uh, someone vomit in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> would, <laughs> uh, would you rather be caught in the act by a cop or your in-laws? What's the act? Am I cooking something? Uh, the act would be uh, the sexual act, sir. Oh, the, oh, the full-on sexual act. The full-on, yeah. By my in-laws or a police officer? Hmm. Am I, like... Ah, interesting. I'd probably lean into the police officer catching me. Yeah. Okay. Pay okay. the fine, never have to see the guy again. In-laws, you you got to see them again. That's true. That's and true. It's going to come up at the dinner table or something. Like, you that's know. true. Yeah. Unless yeah. someone's like, you know, recording it or something. Well, that's a, that, now you're throwing in curveballs here. <laughs> that's know. true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Get a match these factors. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this, this, these questions were well thought out. Uh, <laughs> would you rather spend five years in prison or mm -hmm. 20 years in house arrest? Mm, I'd say five years in prison. I go nutty in house arrest. And you know, in prison, you get to exercise, you get fresh air. You're not really, you know, you don't have to deal with people except for you know maybe the the rapists or something. Potential but probing again. Potential probing, but that takes you back to the aliens, right? So it really depends what you're comfortable with at the end of the day. You know, fair, fair, yeah, yeah. fair. All right. Uh, would you rather lose a limb or lose access to the internet forever? 
<laughs> I would happily lose access to the internet forever over losing a limb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Number ten. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this one goes up to eleven. Okay. All right. Would you oh. rather take a body shot off of Eric Vetter or Doug <laughs> Ford? <laughs> well, I would have to say Eric Vetter. So I know him. But I you're, you're going to always see him, though. I, that's fine. I, you know, I've Good him friend him. and great I, studio I, mate. I, uh... I've seen him many, many times in unflattering <laughs> circumstances. A little body shot off his belly button there. Okay. No problem. No problem. Well done. Well yeah. done. Yeah. Uh, I, I could I could say that you did pass. You did pass the test. Oh, uh, finally. Okay. <laughs> and I look forward to watching this at the rate of tweets. <laughs> <laughs> finally, uh, what is your favorite version of Dracula? Favorite version? Oh, interesting. Uh, yes. You know, I'm trying to think of how many f versions I'm familiar with. I've seen a, a bunch of the classic films. Um, the Coppola, and I have a few different books by artists. Um, man, that's a that's been so long. I, you know what? I love the Bella Lugosi. Uh, this version. one's harder than the probing question, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> but but the most he was like, yeah, probe, probe. go, yeah, probe is fine, but you, know, you have to choose a film. But to be honest, I think I think I still love the Francis Ford Coppola one, I haven't seen it in a okay. long time. Uh, that's the one that sticks out most vividly in my mind, even though I've seen a bunch of the earlier Hammer ones and uh, and things over the years. But uh, those are more probably for nostalgic value. Uh, I can't think of any recent adaptation that I've I've read or seen. You know, I had a great uh, volume illustrated by Edward Gorey. Oh which yeah, I, which I thought was huh. quite beautiful. But I mean, the text is still the same, so it's not really changing the version of it, it and i think really... that was originally a stage design too wasn't it I, well, I'm, I oh think... i'm not sure i don't know or at I least know. i know you can get like a little puppet theater version with those designs oh, really? oh, that's yeah i'll have to google that to see if i was cool. yeah. oh, I didn't know about i'm that. remembering correctly yeah i know but that was a beautiful book but like it didn't really change the experience overall of the of the the book itself so you know i think i, I quite love the unique take that uh uh, Francis Ford Coppola did at the time, but like I said, I haven't seen much since. Like, has there been a lot of Dracula? Well, was there was that recent uh, Netflix one that was sort of a contemporary oh, version, oh, yes, but yes, I feel yes. like only the first uh, the, the first episode one. was the really good one, and then the other two yeah, just sort of they kind of, yeah, they, they kind of dwindled. That was a great actually. I love the take on that. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's what that's what that's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Which one? For... Oh, the Francis Ford Coppola. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, sounds I mean, good. Ke Keanu Reeves' yeah, great very, accent. Uh... Very popular, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very popular. I know one. it's boring, but the. the, the no, no, the... far and away, the most oh. popular answer has yeah, been yeah. Francis. But again, for I sure. feel like this is the age of the and demographic of the folks we're asking. And, and Gary it's Oldman. All, it's it's oh. also the film that's probably most uh, resonant in people's minds. You know, it came out in what, the early. Or late 90s, early 2000s? The but... 90s, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's, you know, that's the last big uh, tentpole version of Dracula. Like, if you were to ask me Frankenstein, I might lean into De Niro's version. You know, really? Like, well, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it, I'm trying to think of another. I mean, I love the classic version, but the De Niro <laughs> version is actually the closest to the book compared mm -hmm. to, like, say, uh, some of the older versions. Um, but, anyways, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Oh, and actually, well, actually, with uh, Frankenstein, I would say the rights in book. It was oh, absolutely. Is my oh, yes. Version. Yeah, that's but, true. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, prior to that, you have all the the older stuff, but that's like the 50s, 60s, 40s, maybe? Or mm -hmm. 70s, yeah. The yeah, hammer yeah. stuff yeah. in the 70s, and then the... Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, I mean, we have lots yeah, of from... vampire stuff, but not necessarily Dracula. Right. Well, from the stuff. 80s onwards, all the classic monsters did reach the camp parody phase, right? Starting yeah, with Young Frankenstein yeah, in the well. 70s. So. I feel like... Or <laughs> Abbott and Costello movies. I feel like I saw... Yeah, I feel like I saw a cool ad adaptation that was more of like a Vlad the Impaler adaptation. Mm. Or a take on the Dracula, not necessarily... Uh, Dracula itself. So yeah, I mean that's the it resonates the most because I think it's for me the most recent in my mind. 
Well, it's uh, very cool that you've actually wandered into uh, Frankenstein territory, given the fact that uh, <laughs> there be might be. Book? Uh, Martin, is, could there could there possibly be possibly. a follow up in the works? Possibly, nice, possibly. Nice. We'll see. Uh, well, thanks again, Ramon, for doing this oh, and for being pleasure, such man. a good sport. Um, I, and, I, was, I, was, I was expecting much harder. Uh, really? There. Yeah. You gotta, okay. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, Poor yeah. Kalman. Kalman's up next, and uh, <laughs> so, and I think he's the last one before we kick off uh, Dracula Vision. So nice, nice. We're gonna have to make it uh, memorable. Yeah. Make <laughs> through some fiery hoops there. Yeah. yeah, I don't yeah. think uh, Ramon will blink an eye to, with, in terms of uh, sort of the sexual questions. It's usually more the gross ones that you have uh, strong uh, reactions yeah, to, I think. Yeah, I think the gross ones, yeah, you don't want to get too gross. Yeah, I think like, you know, my, my girlfriend's like, would you wade through like a mile of shit? Or, <laughs> you know, and I'm always like, Who, well, whose shit is it? Is it well, my shit or is it somebody else's shit? Well, we you found know. out that Eric Vetter would uh, likely vomit on a baby rather than get vomited <laughs> on by a baby. Interesting. So, uh, Interesting. Yeah. So again, I, I look forward to the raid. Uh, that yeah. would be the other pull quote. Is that after? <laughs> is that after the body shots or before the body shots? Is what I want to know. We'll go that, find babies to vomit. That's a party. <laughs> we'll, we'll all find out at the Dracula Visions party. I love um, it. I love it. All right. All right. So thanks again, Ramon. And I cannot wait to see your Dracula vision, uh, which will be the cover, uh, the special. Special cover to our hardcover uh, edition of Dracula Vision. Yeah, no pressure at all. (laughs) And once again, thank you, Sam, uh, for asking all the uh, mature questions. Wonderful. And thank you, they're, everyone, they're, for watching. The ones I'm genuinely interested in, in asking. <laughs> nice. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Take care. <laughs>